do a lot of these. Hello everybody and welcome back to the Petri Dish. We are here in Chicago at Vimon and uh, I'm hanging out with a guy who was up on stage and said a few words uh, yesterday at the keynote here at Vimon. And uh, Danny, why don't you go ahead and introduce yourself and just kind of talk about why we're here. Sure, uh, I'm Danny Allen. I'm, I head uh, product strategy for Veeam and we're really excited about unveiling this new messaging that we're doing. So Veeam has often been associated with backup for virtual machines, but we've expanded well beyond that, that we can protect broad uh, spectrum of all infrastructure for organizations. So we're uh, getting that message out into the market. We're talking with customers. We're really excited. And so why don't we dive in there? Because I, uh, this is my third or fourth Veeam on. I can't remember here. And um, I've known Rick Vanover for a while. I've yep. watched the Veeam. I, I, I don't like to say grow up, but I mean, you guys really have grown up over the past five years. You used to just be this little nodule of really good backup and recovery. And now we're starting to see the ecosystem expand around. And can you talk about how you guys are growing in that capacity? Sure, you know what's funny is we started in a very niche market. It was VMware only, and we wanted to be the very best we could be at VMware. Yep. And over the years we've added Hyper-V, we've added Acropolis hypervisors, and we always said we're never gonna do physical. We're never gonna go beyond the virtual world because there's so much opportunity. But as we began selling to enterprises, you know what they sure. said? Give us a physical, give us cloud protection. And so we've expanded well beyond that to data protection at a broad spectrum. Interesting. So there's been a couple messages here. One that I've latched onto is Office 365. You guys have been uh, moving into that and you've got new products coming down, but also enterprise. Can you, can you talk about how you guys are moving into the enterprise, the challenges you're having there? Because clearly going from a company that's 5,000 seats or 5,000 users is one thing, but then when you go up to that 50,000 or 100,000, that's a whole different can of worms. It is. You know, it's funny when you go to the large enterprises, they often want uh, older technologies that you, that, are not uh, are not on the cutting edge. So they might be asking for AIX and Solaris or Case Solaris. Support. Solaris still, believe it or not. Don't, please don't tell me they're still running on AS 400s as well. <laughs> You'll be surprised what we see out there. Oh no! <laughs> <laughs> so the enterprises want greater breadth. They want cloud support. But they also say, "Can you help me leverage this data for positive business value?" And so we have a lot of conversations about unlocking the, the data for the enterprise to drive greater intelligence to help them serve their customers. Interesting. It's funny how when you say the bigger they are, the older they want. So not, you know, obviously not a general rule, mm -hmm. um, but um, it obviously applies to some. And so how do you guys approach that? Because you guys have been pushing and pushing and pushing. Is it, do you kind of have to reset expectations at that point? Or, or how do you guys approach that? Well, we, we always prioritize these things based on the customer. So the reason why they're running AIX, the reason why they're running Solaris is they have these systems that are 20 years old and they're really mm -hmm. critical. If they weren't critical, they would have discarded them or, or right. them by the wayside. But so they need the support and we prioritize based on the customer, based on the industry need uh, and add those to the platform. Interesting. And so if we, it seemed, unless I completely misunderstood, a lot of it, your keynote was kind of talking about the evolution and how you guys are growing and how you look at data. And, and can you kind of talk about through the, that journey that you guys have gone through as you've explored data and how it's, how it's honestly changing going forward? Yeah, the most exciting thing to me about this conference is we're unveiling what we call the five stages of intelligent data management. And it's because it's a journey towards making our businesses better. Now, it starts with backup and replication. I don't want to minimize that. In fact, it's incredible how many organizations don't get that right. Um, but it starts with there, but then it goes to aggregating across SaaS clouds and, and um, public clouds and mm -hmm. on-premises clouds. And then it goes to understanding and seeing the data across all of that to drive better outcomes and orchestrating movement of data. And finally, our belief is that we're going towards in an era where we leverage intelligence, artificial intelligence to drive those better outcomes with our data platforms. So obviously AI, the only word I think you haven't mentioned so far is blockchain. Uh, but <laughs> no <key> blockchain. <laughs> <laughs> no blockchain for backup. Yeah, you heard it here first, folks, that might be coming. I'm just kidding. Uh, so AI in the backup, how does that work? Because typically people think of a backup is, I just take a snapshot of my data, move it from production to backup, and then eventually offset. How, do, how sure. does AI, because AI feels more living and active as opposed to passive. It does. So, and, and you know what? I sometimes roll my eyes when I hear AI as well. <laughs> so what I like to do is give examples where we are now, but then examples of what customers have asked us for that is okay. AI. Sure. So one of those would be, 
Uh, we have a customer right now leveraging at the edge an intrusion detection system and they leverage that to drive the, the backup and snapshotting technology and capability. Okay. So that's leveraging intelligence from the edge. It's not okay. artificial intelligence, sure. but it's intelligence from the edge to drive a better outcome. I have a customer right now asking for the same thing, but they say, I want to use image recognition. As someone walks into my data center, if I've never seen them before, I'd mm -hmm. like to use that to drive a snapshot of the data and a movement of the data. So that is uh, leveraging artificial okay, intelligence. Okay, I see. I didn't. So when you were talking about walking into the data centers, like guys, don't tell me you're getting the security too. <laughs> but that actually no, no. makes a lot of sense because if somebody walks into the data center, you want to know what they did, and you want to have a really clean copy of the data before they started screwing with it, if they're an un potentially unauthorized user. Yes, so a lot of that artificial intelligence or the intelligence will probably not be within our platform. It's, sure. a, it's our ecosystem of partners that are saying, hey, uh, we saw something, you should do something. Yeah, interesting. That is actually a pretty genuine use case right there. And that's a very active way of looking at backup and recovery. So I want to spin this a little bit. Um, I came from Microsoft's Build Conference last week and they are all, it's all the cloud. The cloud is the only thing that matters anymore. But I know in the back of my mind that it's, and these numbers are a little old, I think as Gartner said, about 65% of spend is still on-prem. What do you see in, on your side of the coin? Like, is it cloud? Is it on-prem? What, what are you seeing these days? Hybrid, no doubt. You know, one of the things that's interesting, we saw a movement early on, people said, hey, I'm going to take my infrastructure, I'm going to put it out uh, into the cloud and leverage infrastructure as a service. But mm -hmm. then we actually saw the pendulum swing back. People took those workloads and moved them back on-premises because one of the things that they found out is the cloud is not a charity. They leverage yeah. in margin, right? So for workloads that are going to the cloud and built in the cloud, those are the ones that tend to stay in perpetuity. But mm. for workloads that started on premises, we tend to see them stay on premises. And so our belief is that this is going to be a hybrid world for a long time to come. Yeah, and that seems to make the most sense because obviously the cloud has many benefits. Yes. But so does on-premises as well because a lot of people, while the cloud promises great performance, you're still tethered by that pipeline that goes from the data center to your office and for some high performance applications where I've actually seen people pull things out of the cloud because they get better uh, throughput just locally, especially for high bandwidth applications. Yeah, and let me tie together two of those things, artificial intelligence and the cloud. So everyone says, let me use the cloud for disaster recovery because it's good for variable based workloads. Yep. But if you're running on premises and in the cloud at the same time, that's 200% capacity. So leveraging artificial intelligence, mm. if you take a news feed of, hey, a storm is coming in, you can immediately set up replication to the cloud at that point. And after the storm passes, you tear it back down again. And you can do that entirely automated through external news feeds. So artificial intelligence, but leverage the cloud for what it's good at. Yeah, that elast elasticity of the cloud is, is realistically one of the primary benefits because you don't have to go buy a new rack from. Yes. Uh, well, I'm looking at HPE's booth over there. I'm sure they would love it if you went over there and bought a rack. <laughs> yes. So. So what's on the horizon for Veeam then? You guys are talking about this holistic data approach, which is really cool. What do you what do you see, and I'd love it if you talk about your products, but I know you don't want to get in trouble. What do you see just as a general trend for the year ahead? Well, I can talk about our products generally. So last year is what I say is, is the year of agents. We had never done physical agents in a major way. We took the agents, we integrated them into the platform to add support for physical systems. What I say about 2018 is this is the year of cloud. And we started out the year by acquiring N2W software, which yep. is cloud protection for AWS. And what you'll see over the course of the year, the major features coming in the next release of our product are all about the yeah. cloud. And Anton Gostev will be talking about those later on today, I guess. Yes. Um, but yeah, this is the year of cloud for us. Big focus on the cloud. It might be the year of the cloud for him, but it's also the year of noise isolating microphones, hopefully, <laughs> because apparently there's a dump truck driving behind us at 9 a.m. in a convention center. <laughs> oh, good stuff. So, this, correct me if I'm wrong, but you guys changed up the conference a little bit this year. This is more of a North America conference, is that correct? Yeah, a little more of uh, North America. Uh, other years we've pushed globally. This year yeah. we do have global attendees, um, but the focus really was on North America, where you have, I think it's 2,200 attendees, so we're pretty happy with the attendance. Well, that's a good size. But let me ask a follow-up question. Are you guys going to be doing events more regionally this year? Oh, absolutely. One of the things that you find if you go to EMEA, for example, very much more focused on GDPR. You go over to APJ and they're very much more focused on their regional yeah. uh, areas. So we do VMON forums, we do VMON tours. It's important to us to get out into the community to engage with our customers and partners. 
Gotcha. So let, I want to, because you mentioned the four letters that uh, are, are scaring a lot of people lately, GDPR, okay. how, do, how does the Veeam portfolio fit into that massive compliance that's going to go effective here in about two weeks? Yeah, so there are, sorry, I have to speak close yeah. to the microphone because of the dump truck. Um, we, have a, we have a feature currently in the product right now where you can tag data to a location and we have lots of customers using that and the reason is because you can't necessarily restore data to a place that you're not allowed to. You can't put it into the cloud, you can't put it into yeah. another country. Already here today. Second capability that's coming in the platform and we're talking about this in a breakout session later today, but an amazing feature that when you restore data, there's a checkbox in the middle to say, are you allowed to restore it? Because GDPR has the right to be forgotten. I can right. say, take my data away. And so if I request that, and then you're trying to restore something where my data is embedded, mm -hmm. we want to make sure that you don't restore my data. I've already yeah. requested not to be forgotten. So we're adding features. But the third one is, we have a, a very strong connection with our ecosystem of partners as well, and we're exposing our data to them as well so that they can classify and tag the data and help our customers drive better outcomes. Interesting, I never really thought about, I mean, it makes perfect sense. The backup is a backup of production. Yes. And if a point in time occurs that you need to remove that data, that, that makes a lot of sense. That's a really actually interesting scenario about how this GDPR, for better or for worse, no matter your opinion on it, just has very wide-ranging impact on everything. I believe in the next three years, we've had a focus on security. I come from a security background, did a lot of compliance and regulatory initiatives around it. And we've been focused on that for 20 years. But I would argue over the next three years, we're going to see a shift towards privacy, which is really what GDPR is about. Yeah. Giving the consumer, giving the individual or organization control over their data. We have not had that in the past in the, in the Facebook and Uber and all of these things that have been happening have really highlighted the need for this. Yeah, it, and from a personal level, I look forward to it because I now have, I think, credit monitoring for the next 90 years <laughs> pro bono from all of uh, the breaches that have stolen my data. At this yeah. point, I assume my social security number is just devalued because it's <laughs> been out there so many times. And so, uh, back of the book here, can you just tell us a little bit about yourself, where you're from, what you're doing at Veeam, and, and if people need to contact you, what's the best way of going about doing that? Sure, well, I, I learn the most from customers. My background, I was CTO at two previous venture-backed companies, smaller companies. Um, I love technology, I love solving problems. The first company was solving problems around security. The next uh, company was solving problems around virtualized desktops in the cloud. And so I'm here to solve problems, and I learn from customers. And so nothing better that I like than getting out, talking to customers, talking to partners, understanding what the needs are. My email, danny.allen at beam.com, you're always welcome to reach out. We, we learn from you. And that's honestly a very good approach. I mean, I was going to say refreshing approach, but you guys have always been that way. I've known Rick Vanover at Veeam for... I don't know, 10 years now, and he's always been, we're just a customer-driven company. We're a customer-driven company. And I, I don't think we've had any Veeam exec on here who, who hasn't echoed that statement, which is a, you know, a great way. Is there anything else you want our audience to know about you before we wrap it up? No, just we're really excited about the future. And you know, a lot of this wouldn't be possible without you, the customer, without our partners, without the ecosystem. You're really the ones that are driving the innovations. We're responding to that. And the exciting thing is we make it better for the end user. And ultimately, this is not about us and IT running infrastructure. It's not about even the cloud. It's about giving those digital services to the end user to make their lives better. And that's what we get passionate about. Very much appreciate your time stopping by, Danny. And uh, folks, that wraps it up for another episode of The Petri Dish. You can find out a whole lot more on our YouTube channel or just find out uh, everything we've doing at Petri.com. Thanks for tuning in. Thank you.